So with no further ado, I'd like to invite our guests to join us for today's chat. First, we have Alan Black, who's the managing director of the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Cinema and also the director of operations at Hot Docs. We have Jackie Party, who's the chief content officer at Super Channel. We have LaShawn McGee, who's the co-founder and CPO of Rivery Inc. We have Lauren Whitelaw, who's the head of programming at OutTV. And we have Mendek Hassan, who is the Programs and Acquisitions Director at Sisterhood Media. And I will pass it off to our director for this, sorry, our moderator for this session, programmer Ravi Srinivasan. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope everybody is safe and warm and cozy, uh, either in their office or their home. Uh, I want to welcome the Academy members, filmmakers, film and TV web lovers from across the country. Uh, we're going to hear from five different uh, talented individuals who are representing these different uh, streaming services and platforms within Canada. Um, we're going to talk about why you should subscribe to them and the kind of programming they're offering. But then also for filmmakers who are here watching, we're going to discuss you know, why you should submit your work uh, and maybe pitch various projects to them. So uh, I, I want to start with LaShawn at Reverie. Uh, LaShawn, can you talk to us a little bit about um, you know, your audience, the, the communities that you serve, and what type of programming uh, you're offering uh, at this point? Yeah, both Absolutely. in format, both in format and theme, I think is important also to talk about. Okay. Uh, well, I'm LaShawn McGee. I'm one of the co-founders and chief product officer for Reverie. Um, we are a queer streaming cable network. Um, we are available in over 130 countries. We've, that's where we have downloads. We have over 250 um, million, um, a reach of 250 million users and devices. Um, we are geared towards entertainment for the queer community in general. Um, we have movies, we have shows, we have podcasts, we have music. We have original programming. We have we're we're available on apps as well as streaming networks. So um, pretty much, if you can turn it on and watch content on it, Revy has an app that's available there. And I apologize for my dog, who's normally not barking right now. It's okay. You can't have a Zoom without a dog or uh, a child. So I think we're all used to it. Um, Mandek, can we hear from about Sisterhood Media and the kind of work and communities that uh, you're serving at this point? Absolutely. So I'm Amanda Cusson, and I am the Programs and Acquisitions Director at Sisterhood Media. And Sisterhood Media is a production house and distributor um, that is by and for communities on the margins. Uh, so that can mean a lot of things. One, it means that we are, we're centered in Toronto, but we don't want to focus entirely on Toronto. We want to kind of decentralize the film industry here in uh, Canada. Um, it also means our filmmakers, um, our communities, so um, BIPOC, women, queer content. Um, we mostly focus on short form content. Um, and documentaries, but we are expanding. So that's the kind of content we have on Sister Media. Great. And uh, Lauren, can we hear uh, about OutTV and the kind of uh, work that you're up to? For sure. So we're OutTV. We are a Canadian linear channel, but we also have services in most of the English speaking world, um, including SVOD and AVOD services. And we have everything that is geared toward the LGBTQ plus community um, from films and documentaries to series, originals um, and beyond. So yeah, that's what we're all about. Great. And so Jackie, Alan, I, I left uh, both of you till the end because I think most are sort of, you know, familiar with two bigger players in the, uh, in the distribution and festival world, but obviously things are changing uh, in the way that we're getting, you folks are both getting out your content. So uh, maybe Alan, we'll start with you and can you talk about Hot Docs at Home and, and what's happening with the festival? Yeah, sure. Th I mean, thanks for inviting me to sit on a panel of uh, subscription services. We're, uh, so you, Hot Docs, obviously festival uh, and a documentary cinema, both of which uh, have not been uh, happening since last March. Uh, we uh, created Hot Docs at Home uh, originally as a Band-Aid uh, solution, just a way to continue getting having our audiences uh, be able to access documentaries. Uh, we pretty quickly learned that it was not just a Band-Aid, but an opportunity for us to uh, you know, expose what Hot Docs does and the films we show to an audience nationally. So we created Hot Docs at Home. We integrated a back-end streaming service with our existing ticketing service. 
Uh, and uh, we are a, a, a hybrid of uh, transactional VOD, so first run films that some of which are available on, on Apple and uh, Amazon and elsewhere. Uh, and then we built and are continuing to build a library of films and content for our uh, 10,000 members. So we have uh, a, a lot of older docs, some theme series and, uh, and some original content. We, we um, produce a lecture series called Curious Minds. We just uh, finished our podcast festival last week. So we've got a growing library of both doc films uh, and content for, for members and non-members alike. Right. And Jackie, Super Channel, you know, I think a, a lot of folks are familiar, motion pictures, television, television series, docs, but, uh, you know, what's happening with uh, your streaming offerings? And, um, you know, there are a lot of ways to access Super Channel these days and wondering if you can chat a little bit about that. I guess I unmute myself here. Um, yeah, so Super Channel, mostly people think of Super Channel as a pay TV service back in the old days when we used that terminology. Uh, now we're just called a, 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 a discretionary service just like all the other channels. Um, we are a national uh, English language uh, Canadian independently owned uh, broadcaster. As you said, we are, you know, typically on um, a television channel. Um, we can be accessed to cable providers, but more recently we are now offered over the top uh, through services like uh, Amazon Prime or Apple TV Plus. And being um, on those platforms has really enabled us to reach um, the court cutters or the cord nevers as your generation and younger are now referred to uh, and that's allowed us to expand our subscriber base because uh, subscribership is our only uh, source of revenue we don't have commercials we are commercial free um, so growing subs is our main objective and uh, offering content that appeals to people in order to get subscriptions is the whole name of the game so since we um, rebranded our channels, we have four channels. They used to be just Super Channel 1, 2, 3, and 4, and it was the same content across all four channels. About three years ago, or four years ago now, maybe, um, three years ago, we rebranded so that they are four very distinct channels. So the brands have their own identity, their own type of content. So Super Channel 1 was rebranded to Fuse, which is your standard pay TV channel. So we have first run movies, series, documentaries, specials, uh, exclusive content um, that is found first on our channel. It doesn't go to cable until it's been on our channel. Uh, the second channel has been rebranded to Heart and Home. And that's um, pretty much um, feel good programming the whole family can enjoy. Uh, female skewing a little bit more than anything. Um, think of Hallmark of the North. That's where you'll find um, made for TV movies that are sort of romance focused or family or even faith based um, content. Um, the third channel is Bolt and that's non-exclusive theatrical movies. So your classics like, you know, uh, Hot Tub Time Machine or the Rocky movies or Goodwill Hunting, and, you know, just theatrical movies that are star studded that um, are in non-exclusive release at this point. And then the fourth channel is Jinx, which is uh, focused on esports, And again, um, very uh, exclusive, not found anywhere else in Canada, a bit more of a niche audience. It's going after the gamers. And so by having distinct audiences, we figure we can zero in and offer programming that um, is appealing and uh, yeah, get more subs. Yes, gaming, a uh, very hot market in the, uh, during the pandemic, especially. Um, so I, I want to find, so I want to speak a little bit to the filmmakers and producers who are watching, you know, I, I imagine that typically with streamers, you're dealing a lot with uh, distri different distributors and things like that, who have multiple films to offer. But uh, what about the filmmakers and producers who haven't found distribution yet in Canada, um, but maybe they've played, um, you know, some festivals and they want to get their film uh, on uh, streaming and, you know, 
to have access to folks across the country. Um, Lauren, I'll start with you. What kind of content does well on your platform, but, and also what kind of content are you seeking out right now? Yeah, we are. I mean, we're definitely looking for things that are dialed into that LGBTQ space. Um, but there's there's such a great range now when it comes to that. We're not necessarily looking for someone to come in as like a distributor necessarily with 12 or 13 movies. You know, we're okay to pick up one or two from someone or maybe a new filmmaker or maybe someone that's created a web series, uh, you know, in season one and we come in on season two and help develop it for, for the channel. There's so many ways now that we can work together and work on content and acquire and things like podcasts have open, opened up a new avenue. So it, it's such a great time, not only to be a broadcaster, but to have um, just this wide range of filmmakers and producers coming to us. Right, and Mandek, I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak to uh, content that does well on your platform and uh, what you're seeking out at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'd say that in terms of content that does well, I find that like our shorter form sort of experimental documentaries do very well um, and have become quite popular. We actually have one of our films, um, Wash Day by Courtney Jackson, who's an emerging filmmaker, is actually playing at Sundance right now. Um, so we have those shorter films that tend to do very well. Um, but I find that as, um, as we grow and as we build, we are becoming more interested in sort of narrative shorts. Um, I think that a lot of the content we have can be kind of heavy and kind of dark. So I'm looking for um, things that are more lighthearted, um, narrative type content, because I feel like that's kind of missing on our platform. So I'm definitely looking for that. Right. And Alan, uh, it's an interesting, interesting space because, you know, you might have a film that might not necessarily have gotten into the festival, but still, you know, a potential play for uh, what you're looking for. Maybe can you talk a little bit about that possibility for filmmakers who might not necessarily had success uh, getting in, but, you know, could be a possibility for you. Absolutely. It's, it's so interesting because the, fe the festival, our programming strategy for the cinema was completely different from the festival. The festival's got 200 films and, you know, a little bit of everything. The mm -hmm. cinema was, uh, you know, we were really looking for broad content stuff that really is content driven a movie about the Beatles would work or Van Gogh or uh, you know architecture those types of things would fill a, a cinema of 700 what we're finding now online is that we can do a little bit of all of those things uh, the opportunity cost is uh, not the same so we can we can stream stuff that is very uh, filmmaker auteur driven we can stream things that are uh, designed for a hundred hardcore fans of a thing we've got a, a movie on PJ Harvey uh, that has been streaming the past month uh, and then we can take uh, more chances than we would have at the cinema because things don't have to hit on opening weekend and they don't have to necessarily um, appeal to everybody they can appeal to a small pocket of people uh, and that's okay. So we, we, I mean, I think ultimately our audience is really there for the content uh, and there is an in, there's a, if you can find the group of people in Canada, then it's something we can potentially stream. Right. And Jackie, you know, so, some folks might have, you know, what, you know, they might consider, they might be, you know, a bit intimidated by Super Channel and, you know, maybe pitching their material or they, they might just not think it's the right fit. But now that you sort of have these specialized channels, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the content that you're seeking out uh, right now or, or what does well on those different channels? Yeah, definitely. Um... I mean, look, we are a, a premium channel, but look who we're up against. We're up against big players like Crave, TV, Stars, HBO, and we can't go head to head with those competitors. We're never going to outbid them on big blockbuster movies or top series. So what we do is we try to specialize and find our own identity in going for more indie films and the the the, the films that you wouldn't get to see in the theaters but maybe at the festivals have a play so the indie darlings the festival hits those are the um, tier of films that we typically uh, take on and series that maybe are hits somewhere else in the world but haven't been in Canada uh, and we'll take a look at those and and you know have limited runs of um, 
big hits from other parts of the world. So we try to find our um, identity in being that sort of um, indie type of service. Uh, and so filmmakers shouldn't be intimidated. We're more open to them than than anyone else. So I get lots of calls and I, I green light lots of uh, pre-licenses. Um, there's, there's no shortage of, of work out there, so. That's great to hear. So everybody, if you're listening, Super Channel is open and listening. LaShawn, can we uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, what kind of content does well uh, with Reverie and you know what are you seeking out right now in terms of theme or format? Absolutely. Um, we are looking for diverse stories. We're looking for we're looking for the story that you haven't you don't get to hear all the time. We're looking for the story that you know speaks to someone in say the middle of the country and you know just different perspectives. Um, but we are open to format, so we have feature length content as well as short form content, and you can just email us at submissions at reverie.tv. And our content team um, will will reach out and, and let you know um, if if we have something to offer for filmmakers. Um, we also do a lot of canvassing, just like everyone else. We we go to film festivals. We um, talk to people online. We we network. We also um, get content from distributors. So there's there's various ways that we get content. But um, we really also like to try to. Reverie's kind of a family when it comes to the filmmakers that we license content with. So you know, like like um, Jackie was saying, or, or I think actually maybe maybe it was Lauren. Um, we also uh, pick up seasons uh, where it's like see, the filmmaker has already done season one or two, and they're they they're on their way to doing season three, and we partner to collaborate to get content finished um, in that way as well. So um, there are a variety of ways to kind of you know become a part of the Reverie ecosystem, and the beauty of it is that we're available on smart TV devices like Apple TV, Roku, um, Amazon Fire, those kinds of devices. So you know it you know as far as people feature length content, we have something for every type of device that you may want to watch on. So we do find that, you know, having a variety of content, short form content plays as well as feature length. Great, great. So if you have work emerging or you're experienced, um, all five of these organizations have their doors open. So do not hesitate to uh, submit. I want to get into pitching to uh, your various organizations. Now, um, maybe just a quick show of hands. Who who are open to pitches? Are you helping develop original content, and is that part of your game? Just a show of hands, and then we can yeah. Lashawn, Alan, not so much. Or we we I mean we have our you know in terms of streaming on the platform, not so much. But we do have our funds uh, that are we have various funds that are available and pockets funding uh, that existed pre-COVID and continue to exist. Right. And LaShawn with Reverie, are you, are you accepting uh, pitches for original content at this point? We, we can accept pitches. Um, we are, we usually primarily get finished work and we encourage finished work. Um, unless of course there is a pathway for, for creation, meaning um, we do branded um, content deals. So there are opportunities to create a show from scratch. We don't really do development in house, but we contract that out to the filmmaker. So if the if there's a pitch that has the funding, or we have you know um, an advertiser that is already working with us, and we can bring everybody together for that, um, we have done those types of things. Yes, uh, but primarily we do more so finished work or work that needs only like sweetening for audio or you know color correction and those kinds of things. Right. Right. Okay. So we've we've heard from some of the audience members, you know, wanting to to know, get a little intel on pitching. So uh, Jackie, Lauren, Mendek, well, you know, you can touch briefly on this, but you know, what are, is there an industry template or guide that the filmmakers out there can reference in terms of pitching? Like, you know, obviously when you get an email, you want it to be of industry standard and you want to, you know, look professional. And so is there anything that you can sort of point to or uh, specific points that should definitely be included in a pitch doc? I guess I'll go. Or, sure, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't have a template necessarily at Super Channel. Um, it's best to submit any um, any uh, pitches or requests for meetings directly to me. Um, 
you know, we're, we're always looking at, uh, you know, feature length uh, content. Uh, so I don't engage in, you know, developing anything shorter, any short form content. Um, just, uh, I had something in my mind that I was gonna say, oh, we aren't into development anymore. We used to be, but it's best to come to us when you're further along in your uh, process, when you're close to production. We're typically uh, the last in, in terms of your financial uh, structure. So we just can't do the heavy lifting financially. So when you've got most of the pieces in place, that's when we are best to come in and, and take a look at your project. And um, yeah, always open to pre-licensing uh, and taking pitches. So just send me an email. Great, and then Nancy just uh, asked a question. Is that both for narratives and docs, Jackie? Yes, and if Great. you have material you can send me, like in a lookbook or you know, just any kind of um, visual, or I, I don't necessarily need to read scripts, but if you have like a, outline i'm happy to read that anything that can give me a sense of what the project is visually and in terms of content that's great right and uh lauren uh we'll hear from you about you know your sort of thoughts on pitching um you know what to include do's and don'ts and are you looking for uh format also um you know 10 minutes 2244 series feature length what is what's our tv looking for I mean, ideally, we take things in the shorter, um, you know, feature length is hard for us, uh, just because there's not a lot of return on investment when it comes to film. But when it comes to pitching, honestly, for out TV, I mean, I've been there, I know what it's like to have a what you think is a great idea. And I know it's going to be perfect for this channel. And honestly, we're just we're all in the industry. All, like I, I'm absolutely open to hearing something from a log line to I have a great talent. Um, I wonder if you'd be interested in, in seeing something on that, on them, maybe developing something around them. Um, I, I read a lot of scripts and give feedback that way, um, all the way up to here's a finished product. What are you thinking? Would this work with your, your current lineup? So for me and for, for the development team at OTV, it really, it really can be anything. We're, we're not closing our door to anything at this point. It just really does have to speak to our audience and to our current programming. And that's basically it. There's really no, no formula, no right or wrong with us. And you're, I'm certainly not going to close a door if it doesn't come in in a, in a correct format. Um, but yeah, we look at everything from that short form, um, 11, 12 minute space, all the way up to um, to full series and and uh, and documentaries, feature length docs, all that. Great. And Mendek, can you talk a little bit about Sisterhood and the kind of pitches uh, that they're accepting at the moment? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we um, accept um, usually shorter form content. I'd say forty minutes and under. I think personally, I actually we prefer like around the ten minute mark, like really short form content. I think that's what. Um, our audiences really tend to look for. So um, that's what we go for. In terms of pitches, I find that like there is so much uh, information and advice out there online on social media in terms of how to format a pitch. Like there are so many Facebook groups you can join, so many Twitter threads by um, veterans in the industry who have so much to offer and they're just giving away this advice for free. So I'm sure if you look online um, for that, you can definitely figure out um, how to format a pitch deck. Um, in terms of submitting to Sisterhood Media, we actually just launched um, this year to do, um, starting to do pre-sale deals um, to invest in short films and um, also web series creators um, who are kind of starting off, but are still in the, trying to figure out financials. Um, so we're trying to really help filmmakers um, get off the ground and kind of get their, their first money towards getting their short form content together. Um, so yeah, just we have on sisterhoodmedia.net, there's a submission form, um, or you can email me directly at Sisterhood Media with your pitch deck or idea, and we can um, build together to kind of put something together. Like, like Lauren was saying, we're not going to turn folks away because things aren't formatted in any sort of way. You know, um, we're all open to learning and growing together. That's great. Uh, LaShawn, Alan, did you want to add anything to that aspect at all? Um, I mean, for, for us, I, I, like that, I like that you mentioned um, duration. Uh, because I think I think that like like for short form content, I feel like 11, 11 to 12 minutes is a, a sweet spot, especially since we have our content. We're not just a subscription service. We also have um, ad supported free content as well as um, live channels that are running with ads. So in, for the from from a programming perspective, 
it's a lot better to have a piece of content that's 11 or 12 minutes than like eight or eight or six or eight. Um, I would also say that um, on the pitch side, what I've found is that there are a lot of filmmakers that, you know, they, they have their, have a way of, you know, getting things done in their community and making things with the resources that they have available. And I found that um, letters of intent for just dis distribution are very helpful in helping them secure funding. And we've done that quite a bit with, um, with filmmakers. So that is the one way that definitely um, we, we look for those opportunities when they're available. That is, uh, yeah, that's a great piece of information for filmmakers to consider uh, as they're moving forward with development or even post-production. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, a little bit of a finer question in terms of, um, you know, festivals deal with a lot with premiere status. You know, if you get into one festival, you might, and you play there, you might not get into another festival because of that. And, you know, I know that some of these streaming licenses have a short-term uh, deal, or it might be a year, it might be six months, it could be a week, you know, who knows. So I'm wondering, is there that kind of thing? Well, if it's already played on out TV, then, you know, we're not going to play on Revue, or if it's, if it was on hot docs for a month, then, you know, Super Channel's not going to take it. Um, do you, are, are, the, are these kind of things that the filmmakers and producers need to consider uh, when, you know, finalizing these deals? Um, let's start with, let's start with Jackie. Uh First of all, we're only concerned about exclusivity in, in our own, um, you know, playground. So basically, if, if a film is in a festival, that's fine. It's not on broadcast. Once you're trying to get your movie into the broadcast world, we want exclusivity. Um, our terms are usually 18 months. So we would take an 18 month window. Now, everything's negotiable. So, you know, sometimes we've we've uh, taken a shorter term for less of a license fee. So all these things are negotiable, but typically if you're on our service, then we would want to be exclusive and we wouldn't want your movie to be on any other channel. Um, now in terms of uh, other platforms like um, On Demand, we would ask that you, um, you know, hold back against say ad supported On Demand or other subscription services at the same time as you've got your, your title on our service. But uh, certainly transactional is not a conflict because you know it's still a better value for someone to subscribe to Super Channel and get lots of movies than to pay one fee to see your film one time. So it's really the value proposition. Uh, when it's on Super Channel, it should be the best value for the viewer. So therefore we don't want to compete with other platforms that would also have the movie at the same time, so. Right. Um, Mandak, can you uh, talk about that sort of competition with other <laughs> platforms and things like that? Is that something you're, that's a deal maker breaker for you? Uh, no, at Sisterhood Media, um, we do non-exclusive contracts. Um, you know, a lot of our filmmakers are emerging and um, they're doing short form content. And a lot of times we find content that's just sort of sitting and collecting dust on Vimeo or on YouTube. So we want to pay filmmakers for their work and we don't want to stop them from, um, you know, making a living by being on other platforms. So we have non-exclusive um, contracts um, that usually last a, a year. Right. Uh, Lauren um, can hear from you and sort of how our TV navigates that, that landscape. Yeah, if we're commissioning a project, um, we definitely want exclusivity. Um, if we're just down to uh, acquiring, we kind of like to keep it off of YouTube only because, or, or to be something maybe for free. Um, but that's, that's a, all, like Jackie said, everything's negotiable at this point. We are really open to finding a way to make everything kind of work and make everyone happy. We certainly don't want to take money out of people's pockets and things like that. So we're definitely open to, to finding a way to make things work when they work for our channel. Uh, LaShawn, um, any uh, further to that as well? Yeah, um, Reverie's not exclusive for general content. So on average, if you submit something to Reverie and you have it on other platforms, that's fine. For Reverie Originals, we try to do more of an exclusivity um, so that we can get the, so that we're the one stop for that particular thing since we're putting kind of our name on it. Um, so it's a little bit different than everything else. Um, basically also with licensing, our, our licenses are anywhere from two to five years. So um, it, it just depends. We do, we do kind of a rolling, we have a rolling option, which is 
uh, for the five year deals, you have the option to to terminate license at at year at, at 24 months if you choose. Um, but what we really kind of we want to keep people in the ecosystem, and we find that. It, it depends on your filmmaking style and your distribution style and your plan. So if if you've planned to have it, to give it the widest reach po possible, that may work for some filmmakers, but also just understand when you spread your audience thin, you're not necessarily going to get that collective experience that you need. And it may affect revenue depending on, on what kind of deal you're signing. So just be aware that, you know, that is, that is potentially a case too. And Alan, uh, can you talk a bit about Hot Docs at Home and sort of, you know, if, you know, if it's already been on, you know, NFB or TIFF or, you know, or Reverie or OTV or Sisterhood, you know, is that something that you're going to shy away from or are you open as well to that? No, I mean, I'll, I'll, we would, as a, as a nascent uh, streamer, like we would love some exclusives because it would bring some new people to the platform, but we know that's not why people are coming to us. They're coming there for the curation. So, you know, we'll, we'll take, things that are other places and either build a Q and a or some content around it, or we'll, you know, have it incorporated as part of something larger, a larger series or something thematic that will give it context. So it, 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 exclusivity isn't really relevant to us. And I should say too, I mean, we have, um, our documentary audience is so concentrated that there are films that are, we have non-exclusives and, you know, it, we're, we're very surprised to learn that we're, you know, holding our own with some of the bigger, you know, with the bigger TVOD services, uh, because people are looking for docs with us, they're not necessarily going to Apple for for their doc fix. So, yeah, exclusivity is not a not a big deal for us. Right, Alan, I want to stick with you. Um, you know, interesting uh, pivot for you to go online, and, and I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, what that's been like. Because you know, there's perhaps a lot of festival. There could be festival programmers and and also filmmakers curious. You know, about the reach that uh, Hot Docs has been able to achieve with going from in-person to online and the type of audience that um, you've been able to sort of, you know, discover um, who are watching online versus in theater. I think, I mean, I think it continues to evolve month over month. It grows. So I would have had a much different answer in December. We're finally at a place where I think we're matching our in-cinema audience now online. So we're, we, we, you know, we, we started with the, the idea that we would just not lose, we wouldn't bleed members and bleed audience. And now we're at a place where we can go a bit on the offensive and start to grow a little bit. So I think it, it's all relative. I mean, you see, we're not quite virtual cinema. We're not quite streaming service. We fall somewhere in the middle. So it's really hard to, at this point, still define uh, the context around whether our numbers are good or not. But I think they're the fact that they're growing is, is quite something like we're, we're not, we're not offering huge licensing fees and the returns aren't, aren't massive, but they are really a really good, you know, as the cinema was, and as the festival is, it's a really good way to launch a film to other opportunities because it gives it a lot of, you know, whether or not a thousand people are watching or 10,000 people are watching, there are a number of people paying attention to the film itself. So I think it's a, it's a nice launching point for other, other streaming and theatrical opportunities when those you know, are back. Right. Um, all right, we're going to get to some questions that have popped up in the Q and A chat. So if uh, you have any other ones, please chat there. We've got a few minutes left. So uh, we've got some kind of, you know, financial nitty gritty questions here. So uh, hopefully we can answer them. We have a question from Ryan. Uh, how do you, how does your acquisition work? Is there a per minimum price for content? How are rates negotiated? Um, let's start with, uh, let's start with Lauren um, and OutTV and then we'll go around the board so everyone will have to answer this one. <laughs> this is a really tough one to answer. I mean, when it comes to acquisitions, because I don't just buy for Canada, we have services in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. So, so it's just, there's so many things that go into a straight acquisition that it's hard to say. It's hard to say that range. It's hard to say what you're going to get. It depends on if periods of exclusivity. It depends if it's being seen anywhere else, if it's currently on an Amazon or Apple. There's so many variables that go into it that I would just say that, you know, we're competitive, of course, we're not a big company. Um, we definitely have to spread things out over several different platforms, but um, yeah, we're, we're here to, to help 
filmmakers out, we're here to help out producers and we're here to help distributors out. So I would say we're fair in our pricing, but um, it just, there's so much that can go into it. Um, LaShawn, uh, do you want to comment on how acquisitions work? You know, do you have a, a minimum price or anything like that? Or how are rates negotiated uh, back and forth between the filmmaker and Reverie? Well, I mean, I definitely have to agree with Lauren that like there's so many variables that go into it. Um, one of the one is is um, year that the content was produced. You know, ha how many people have seen it? Is it is it something that has you know done not necessarily festivals per se, um, more so distribute on the just distribution side. So when I and when I say that, I mean anything where it can be accessible to a mass audience, like even like YouTube or other places. So those are the things that affect um, the type of deal we can negotiate with a person or the type of deal that we will um, negotiate with people. But as far as, you know, a standard, we don't actually have a standard for that kind of thing. It's more so it is very, very case by case and specific to the project. Right. Jackie, Alan, would you sort of say, you know, agree and say the same thing? Anything really specific to add to, you know, Super Channel or Hot Docs regarding that? Uh, I'll say that it's the hardest question I always get asked and notice no one has mentioned numbers. Nobody wants to commit numbers to the answer of this question. And because it is so case by case. And um, I would say, you know, even doing this job when I first started doing acquisitions, how do I come up with what to offer on something? And, and really all you can do is look at similar type content and what we've paid in the past. Um, again, other variables, the age of what it is, the, the audience appeal, the demand, maybe we don't need this title at this time. I've had, I've taken things for a dollar just because it was thrown into a package because it was more important for the, the distributor to get that title on our service and it was worked into a deal. So, you know, it's supply demand, it's age of content, it's uh, relevance, lots of variables. Sorry, I can't give a more specific answer. Uh, Alan and also Mendek, do you want to anything to add there? Uh, I can I, I can say for we I mean we structure things differently for for a transactional where we use we have agreements that are very similar to what we used to have at the cinema, so very favorable uh, revenue share. Uh, and then for our on-demand uh, membership-based content, I, I think supply and demand. I think that's probably a really good way to define what we're what we're offering. And yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say I think folks have, have covered it for the most part. I don't have much to add on top of that, but yeah, I think it just comes down to um, depending on the title, depending on when they're coming to us. Um, but yeah, we're always open to negotiating and talking things through with our filmmakers. Um, we have a question from Catherine. Uh, Jackie, if you're willing to share uh, who your development person is and, you know, can they, can they be reached and, you know, contacted for, you know, pitching possibilities? Is that something that's uh, available or maybe we can, you know, share that? Well, uh, uh, we actually aren't doing development uh, any longer. We used to have a development right. fund, but uh, since our license renewal of last year, uh, we have now had the requirement to do development um, removed from our um, license. So, and it would be me. So if you have something that you want to do development, we're, we really can't get involved at the development stage, but I encourage you to reach out to me and um, let me know how your project develops. And when you get a little bit closer to production, I'm happy to have a conversation. Right. And uh, Connie had asked, um, you know, for email contacts, we can probably share that. Uh, Katie can probably share that afterwards. Or uh, you can also, uh, you know, hop on to Reverie Out, Sisterhood, Super Channel, Hot Docs, and uh, dig deep for those contacts as well. Um, that we're getting close here to the end. And I wanted before we go, uh, if each of you could, you know, tell us, uh, you know, maybe uh, some hot, uh, content shows films that are currently uh in your lineup and oh we have a few more minutes so if we have any questions please uh drop them in the q a because we have a few minutes to go but while we're here can we go around like you know what's what's your pitch what's your uh pitch to get folks to subscribe you know download 
um, your content at each of you talk to us about what you have uh, on your lineup right now. Uh, we'll start with Alan. Go go ahead. Uh, well, so I'll, I'll talk both fronts. So on on the you know typically January February are the, are the worst months for first run con first run doc content because it's you know right after Sundance things haven't been released this year because of, there's been there was a bit of a holding pattern. We've got great great first run stuff out of last year's festival circuit. We've got a number of amazing things from Sundance uh, 2020. Uh, there's a film called some kind of heaven about a retirement home in Florida, which is the best thing I've seen in years. It's like oh, young Errol Morris. It's kind of a revelation. And on the uh, membership front, uh, we just launched a, a, a monthly membership for the first time ever four ninety nine a month to sort of kind of sample what we're doing. Uh, and we've got, uh, I, I don't know, 40, 50 uh, docs from, the eight years we've been open as a cinema. So it's kind of a primer. If you haven't made it at particular, if you're not from Toronto and haven't made it to hot docs, it's kind of a primer of some of the best of over the past eight years. So worth, worth it for five bucks a month, I think. Uh, great. Uh, LaShawn, can you talk to us? Uh, what are some hot titles that uh, Reverie uh, has on offer right now? Uh, well, right now we are, are um, it being uh, Black History Month in, in America, um, we are celebrating that, um, that content and content that speaks to that part of our diaspora. Um, we have a couple of sources, that, a couple of projects that, I'm, that, I, that I really enjoy. Um, Heavenly Brown Bodies is one and uh, We Can't Breathe is another. Um, also, Revy last year um, launched the first queer women's broadcast channel. Um, um, called OML and Reverie. And that's something that I'm, I'm also really excited about. And it's something that definitely um, should be checked out. And with, with them, um, Crazy Bitch Bitches season two is uh, just, just had a release for that recently. Um, so those are some things I'm pretty excited about. Great. Um, Mandek, what uh, should we look out for at Sisterhood? Uh, yeah, so we are actually just came upon the first year anniversary of Sisterhood Media TV. So we are recently celebrating that. I'd say if you are interested in documentary, um, we have a series called Flat Scope Stories, which is um, interviewing different creatives across the US and Canada. I think that's a really great one that folks could check out. And if you're interested in narrative, I think we have a, doc a film called House, which is kind of about ballroom culture in Toronto. It is a wonderful story of friendship and black love. So I'd really suggest that. Um, and I suggest people check out Sisterhood Media TV. We have a lot of great content coming out this year. And I think it's really important for folks to kind of support niche, smaller streamers and communities and for folks to kind of, you know, put their money where their mouth is and um, show um, support to uh, communities and uh, streamers like Sisterhood Media TV. Great, and Lauren, uh, what should we look out for on OutTV? Well, of course, we're, we have got tons of drag content. So if you love drag queens, uh, you know where to watch them. Um, definitely lots coming out of uh, that space. Um, we have uh, a co-production with Vice coming out um, soon called Shine True, which is a really great heartwarming story. Um, it's kind of a docu-series. We have a scripted series coming out of Halifax called Camboy. Um, we're also working with a company in Montreal to produce a really interesting sort of inside take on the Montreal porn scene called Boy Boy, which is really kind of a yeah, unique take on, on the industry there. Um, but yeah, we're, we have a great um, documentary series called Outspoken, which kind of takes one hour docs uh, from a bunch of different queer filmmakers all across the country uh, on a various different topics, which I think really kind of dials in and brings the community together. Um, but yeah, we're really, really uh, opening up our original production slate. So you'll see a lot of new things coming out of Out TV very soon. And Jackie, what are the uh, you know hot titles we should look out for on Super Channel? Yeah, well, Super Channel is a great service to subscribe to because you get the four channels and something for everybody. So on Fuse, we're going to be um, showcasing some of the uh, indie Canadian titles that we had in our Canadian Film Fest, our virtual film festival that we hosted last year. And so Queen of the Morning Calm is one of the titles coming up. The Cuban is another one. Uh, we have a great uh, crime drama series like uh, called Manhunt Deadly Games about the uh, domestic terrorist Ted Kaczynski. That's airing currently on Fuse. 
uh, and great documentaries, um, Bisping, uh, Fred Penner, This Is My World, um, Lovely, or sorry, Love, The Last Chapter coming up. Uh, on Heart and Home, we're going to be launching season eight of When Calls the Heart on February 21st. So if you're a hearty, tune in. And uh, original Canadian series like uh, Bullock Family Ranch, which is actually done by Boat Rocker, our sponsor for this series, uh, this session. Um, this was a series made for BYU in the States, and it will be found on Heart and Home in Canada. And on vaults for the month of February, you can enjoy a Rocky versus Rambo stunt event of uh, great films. The franchise of both of those films will be um, playing in February. So. Very nice. I might have to check that out. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. And so we'll, we'll have time for one or two. So get them in the Q&A chat box. Uh, Aaron wants to know, do any of your services have close relationships with other distributors or services which cover other territories? Um, you know, for example, with Super Channel, relationship, a relationship with the US network, where uh, if there is a film you're interested in acquiring, you could attempt to coordinate a release. Um, so Jackie, I guess first, well, can you talk about any relationships with other territories and then we'll, we'll go around the border here again. Uh, yeah, I would say um, not that we have a, a formulated uh, relationship, but we are we have like minded broadcasters that we we notice that we have similar programming and they do. And so a producer will, like I mentioned, the boat rocker, um, the Bullock Family Ranch uh, for, for BYU in the States. And we have a similar audience here in Canada. So it's sort of a, a natural fit. And uh, that happens quite often actually. So we kind of look to other broadcasters in other territories that have the same types of audiences and uh, look at what they're doing and see if it makes sense for us as well. Right, Alan, any, you know, other festivals around the globe looking, you know, are you kind of having those conversations to swap titles, things like that? We have, we, we work, we uh, belong to an organization that we helped found called the Doc Exchange, which is a collection of documentary cinemas across the globe. There are more spring or there were more springing up uh, each year. Uh, and we work with them to kind of look for titles around the world that are opening theatrically and try to figure out how we can uh, create best practices and figure out ways to utilize each other's audiences to get people to know about things and, uh, and grow the documentary audience generally. LaShawn, uh, Reverie, have any, you know, ties or connections with any other territories or companies, you know, U.S. and, and abroad? Well, actually, um, we... Our 90% of our content has worldwide territory rights. So it's not so much that that we, you know, are, we're, we're not beholden to a physical geographical location. Um, if you license us worldwide rights, we, you can see it, our content anywhere. Great. Uh, Mandek, any uh, partnerships with Sisterhood Media, um, you know, within the US or abroad? Um, no, we don't have any partnerships currently. Um, but I think that's a really interesting concept and something that we definitely look into. Great. Lauren, um, any sort of, you know, commonalities as kind of compared to what Jackie was mentioning? Uh, OTV, I know that you're distributing in several territories. So um, if you want to discuss a little bit about that. Yeah, there's definitely partnerships and good relationships, you know, from Showmax in South Africa, TVNZ in New Zealand. I mean, you have to we have to be expanding beyond just looking in in Canada only because we do distribute in other territories. So we have to make sure we kind of take a little bit from every country and, and make sure we have content for them. So the the world is basically open as far as where our relationships lie, who we're talking to on a regular basis. Um, it, it's, it's filmmakers, it's companies, it's distributors globally, basically. Great. Uh, well, we have a few minutes. It doesn't look like there are any other questions. Uh, if you want to get a last minute question here, but maybe uh, a final word from everyone here on the panel, um, you know, about uh, maybe, you know, what to look forward to next steps for each of you uh, in the coming future, you know, things that sneak peeks or anything like that, that, uh, you, uh, you know, our Academy members and filmmakers watching uh, can look forward to in the in the long coming months that are ahead. 
Um, <laughs> LaShawn, uh, maybe we can hear from you first, uh, Ravery, any, anything exciting to look forward to that we might not know about? You know, it's interesting because the beginning of the year, I agree, is, is a little slower for us than other other months and other other times that we're releasing content. Uh, we actually just, because we just did our Crazy Bitches uh, launch just recently, um, we have basically thematic things coming up. And there's definitely going to be around Pride season, some really exciting things coming around the pipe. So just stay tuned and um, go to your local app store and download the Revry app or go to revry.tv. Um, if you're submitting content, you can um, email submissions at revy.tv. Great. Uh, Mandek, uh, anything to look forward to or sneak peeks from Sisterhood? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you know, we always have content coming out on Sisterhood Media TV, but I also just want to speak to some of the other things we do as Sisterhood Media. So we have um, our Skillshare Sundays where we um, um, cover all sorts of things. We just had one that was on screenwriting. Um, so folks can sign up for those for free. And if you miss it, you can catch it on Sisterhood Media TV. Um, we also have um, our monthly series where we talk to different industry professionals um, just about like kind of tips and tricks on how to get into the industry. We just did one last night actually with the Box Screen Office that was just created here in Canada. Um, so folks can check that out. And yeah, if anyone's interested in um, submitting, they can go on to sisterhoodmedia.net slash submissions, submit, um, and they could submit their ideas there. Great. And uh, before we get around, if you have any newsletters or listservs that the folks uh, watching can, uh, you know, hop on to, please drop that in the chat, uh, our panelists there. Lauren, uh, what can we look forward to, uh, you know, any sneak peeks from MTV coming up? Yeah, much, much like LaShawn said, it's been a bit of a slow rollout, especially with dealing with a lot of um, filmmakers, things had to get pushed around and moved back because of COVID and things are just starting to kind of slowly roll in. I would say, of course, Pride, again, would uh, would be a big time for us. Um, new things will be coming, especially rolling out over the next few months. We always do our free preview um, to Canadians in, uh, our, I think, April is this year. So there'll be a lot of great things kind of being previewed and being showcased during that time. So that's a great time to check out out TV. Um, but yeah, if you have submissions, they usually typically come through me first. And then um, I have a development team that I work with. So if they're if you are putting emails in um, to the chats and things later, definitely they can be sent to me. Great. Uh, Jackie, what's any what's coming down the pipeline at Super Channel? Anything to look forward to? Yeah, well, we have new stuff coming all the time. We, um, we, we air a new movie every weekend. So that's like four uh, on Fuse alone, four <laughs> movies a week, uh, a month on Heart and Home. Same thing on Vault. We have 12 new titles every month. So there's always new titles flowing through. Um, we've got some exciting uh, things coming up on Fuse. We're going to be hosting the uh, Canadian Film Fest again. We did this last year as a as a reaction to the pandemic. And sorry, Ellen, I don't mean to you know play in your sandbox here, but um, yeah, we're going to be uh, again the home for uh, the Canadian Film Fest. Um, that's going to be uh, sometime in April. So keep your eyes open and see what's coming on that platform. Great. And Alan, anything? Uh, what's coming up on Hot Docs at Home uh, titles to look forward to uh, in the future? Cool. Firstly, I, I, I actually do really love and appreciate the way the sandboxes have all come together. I think it's actually <laughs> a, a bit of a terrific thing to have happened. You know, TV, film, it's all We're great We're all content. in the same ecosystem, so right? I actually quite love it. Um, yeah, totally. And it's just getting more films to more people. So I think that's great. Uh, I, you know, Hot Docs at Home aside, our festival is happening at the end of April. We're not 100% sure what shape it's going to take ultimately in terms of screenings but uh, we do know that our conference team is putting together a really great virtual edition of the conference uh and our our pitch forum will be happening deal maker will be happening all the usual hot docs um hot docs events we've got some great speakers lined up for the conference uh registration opened last week and uh i i think you know it's a great time to come out to the festival particularly if you couldn't come into toronto previously so uh, that's having I mean, hot dogs at home. We're continuing to build uh, a content library. We've got, I think, something like 30 new titles uh, being released at the end of February, uh, including a spotlight on Quebec film. We just launched a, a spotlight on Alberta, like some of the some great films that have come out of Alberta out of the, uh, over the past uh, decade. So it's uh, it's really exciting. It's really exciting to keep experimenting and trying new things on a, on a platform. 
Well, everyone, uh, this has been very insightful and rewarding. And so I want to thank uh, all of you, LaShawn, Mendek, Lauren, Jackie, Alan, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Uh, I want to thank our sponsor, Boat Rocker, and of course, the Academy and all the members and filmmakers uh, and guests who tuned in. And Katie, throw it back to you.